Uh, today we have Sarah Kapnick from um, both Princeton and uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Sarah is a postdoctoral researcher associated the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Program, a collaborative program of Princeton University and the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory here in NOAA. Her scientific research is focused on understanding global and regional climate change and climate variability. Sarah's current work investigates changes in hydroclimate and snowpack and in implications for water supply. Sarah is the recipient of the Princeton Space Science Graduate Fellowship, the Berkney's Award from UCLA, as well as numerous other academic awards. Sarah earned a PhD in atmospheric and oceanic sciences and an MS degree in atmospheric sciences from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Princeton University. Sarah? Thank you. So the first slide is just to orient us in the northern hemisphere. Right now, it's in March, you have mainly snow cover over all the land masses in the northern um, hemisphere. You have it over North America and over much of Europe. Um, and Eurasia, and so you have the snow cover is in the white on this picture. Um, so snow is a major part of the climate system, um, particularly in the northern hemisphere. <coughs> so the talks that I'll give you today, um, basic uh, outline is that I'll go through some motivation background. I'll explain the model simulations and reanalysis that we use to do this research. I'll go through the control climate validation of the new GFCL model. I'll give you an idealized future climate of what snow is going to look like, otherwise known as the shuffle. And I'll give you a brief summary. So there are two main measurements of snow variables that we have that are in the observations and ways of tracking snow. So the first on the left-hand side of this slide is snowfall. So Snowfall has both a meteorological measurement and a hydrologic and climate model measurement. So the meteorological measurement is snow depth. When snow falls, it's very fluffy. It collects on the ground. And on a daily basis, people will take snowfall measurements. Now, that snowfall depth that they're measuring is actually just the height of the snow column. However, in hydrologic and climate models, we measure it in terms of snow water equivalent. So that's actually the snow depth times the snow density. It's if you took that column of snow that falls in a given point in time and you melt it down to water. So this is a much cleaner measurement for climate and hydrologic measures because you're actually tracking how much water is in the snow. Because depending on the temperature that the snow falls, it can be really fluffy and really wet, um, or it can be really, really dense. Um, so snowfall is then taken as a value or a specific time period, similar to precipitation. On the right-hand side, the other main <coughs> snow variable is snow pack. So snow pack is the seasonal snow on the land surface. Um, it collects during the winter and then melts during the summer. It's given as an instantaneous value of what is seen on the ground. <coughs> so it has two different measurements. One is its height measurement in terms of snow water equivalent. So again, it's the snow column that's on the ground um, melted down into water in the height of that water. And it also has the surface area measurement. Um, and that is measured by snow covered area, or the surface area of land covered by snow. So the very first slide that I showed you, much northern hemisphere in winter is covered by snow. <coughs> so what modulates the snow variables? Both precipitation and temperature combine um, to modulate snow by uh, three main processes. The first process is the amount. The amount of snow that falls is dependent on the amount of precipitation falls during winter. The type, so if snow collects, it's either, it collects if it's below freezing. If it's above freezing, the precipitation falls into rain instead of snow. And also through melt. <coughs> so the first two types are of or the first two um, words, amount and type, modulate snowfall, whereas all three of these processes modulate snowpack, because snowpack is, a, is the only one that's affected by the snow melt of what's on the ground. <coughs> so snow is very important for the water budget. This graph is a hydrologic model result um, that has taken observations of precipitation and temperature, put it through a hydrologic model, and calculated a ratio that's given in the color bar below 
of total snowfall divided by total runoff for the year. Um, now, so what you see in most of the northern hemisphere, as well as part of the Andes in the southern hemisphere, is that this ratio approaches one in many parts of the world. Now, the red lines that are outlining um, these dark areas is where stream flow in the region is snowmelt dominated, and there is not adequate water reservoir storage for all of the snow that falls. <clears throat> the black lines are then areas where the water availability is also dominated by snowfall um, dominates stream flow. However, the snow doesn't fall in that actual region. So this entire region in the black line is where the hydrology is dependent on snowfall. So places in the world where much of the water resources are coming from snowfall. And it just so happens that roughly one-sixth of the world's population lives in this extended domain. So for much of North America, um, and Eurasia, mainly Eastern Europe into Asia, you have most populations are depending on snowfall for their water resources. <clears throat> and this also is an issue in South America, but, or in the Southern Hemisphere, and mainly in South America, and a little bit in New Zealand. <clears throat> so how is climate going to affect, um, affect us through snow? So the upper left corner, um, changes in climate will affect water supply and flood risks. 50 to 80 percent of all water supply in the western U.S., for example, comes in the f form of snowmelt. States like California only have liquid water reservoir capacity for one-fourth to one-fifth all of the total winter precipitation. Therefore, if you have changes in the amount of snow that falls, or if the snow all falls as rain instead of snow in the winter, you can't actually capture all of it in the reservoirs. As a result, water then has to be released to the ocean to avoid flooding if there's a big storm during the winter. <clears throat> so as a result, if you lose this natural reservoir of snow in the mountains in the western U.S., you can really affect the water supply in the summertime. <clears throat> On the upper right-hand side, um, changes to snow can also change the albedo. If you reduce the snow cover, over the land surface, you're going to reduce the surface albedo of the land surface, and it causes an albedo feedback, which can intensify seasonal warming in the month of March. <clears throat> On the bottom left, um, another major issue is the altered effectiveness of hydropower. Earlier snowmelt changes when you're having the timing of stream flow, which can then change hydropower, um, because a lot of hydropower has been developed, assuming that you have uh, stream flow during certain times of the year. So if you change the timing of when the snow is melting off from some of these mountain reservoirs, you're going to change when your power can be produced. In the bottom right-hand corner, um, snow melt is also actually really tied to wildfire risk. Snow, when it falls on the ground and when it, it locks in the moisture for the season, and then when it starts to melt, it replenishes the soil moisture. And once the snow is gone, that leads to soil moisture drying and drying of the plants in the area in most of the western U.S. where you don't have a lot of precipitation during the spring and summer. As a result, if the snow melts significantly earlier, you increase wildfire risk in the summer and fall in the western U.S. So particularly in the U.S., um, snow is really important, and we've built our infrastructure based on certain snow melt timings and certain amounts of snowfall in the given year. And changing the amount of snow that we have in the time that it melts can greatly affect us. <clears throat> so it's really important to understand global snow and how that's changing. However, there's a difficulty in validating it and understanding how it's been changing. The reason for this is that there's a limited availability of reanalysis products for all snow variables, um, including snowfall and snowpack. <clears throat> There aren't direct observations there globally, except for recently with um, satellite data. <clears throat> and there's also a limited length of the available observing system. So it's difficult to validate a lot of the global snow. <clears throat> As a result, we have some studies that are case studies of observations that we can look at um, to understand what types of behavior we might expect or want to see when we start looking at the global data. So this is a case study of the western U.S. On the left-hand side, the figure 
is of snow melt onset trend. So from the, and this figure shows from 1950 to present, the trend in terms of days per decade of snow melt onset um, in Western North America, really West, mainly Western US. The filled circles are statistically significant. The open circles are not statistically significant. What we see here is the vast majority of locations over the Western US have seen snow melt timing increase by two days <coughs> per decade. So from 1950 to present, that's roughly, snow melt is occurring roughly two weeks earlier now than it did in the past, almost everywhere. On the right-hand side is a figure of February to March accumulation trend. So during the month of February, this is showing how much snow typically accumulates during that month at the station location. And actually, here we see there's actually a positive increase in accumulation in parts of California and the south, uh, southern Rockies. You can see that it's blue. So this is a mixed information that the snow melt is occurring significantly earlier. However, during the early month of February, in some locations you actually have more snow. <coughs> um, however, in the late season, because of the early snow melt trend, we actually see that there's less snow across the western U.S. So this case study brings the question of what would we see if we were able to actually model this going forward in a global climate model. <clears throat> um, part of the reason that this hasn't really been looked at a lot from global climate models um, directly until recently is that <clears throat> you need to properly get both temperature and precipitation to understand changes in snow. The top figure is of the CMIT-3 models, and the bottom figure is of CMIT-5 models, more recent models. And this graph is showing you the skill of these models to get both precipitation and temperature, where skill is measured by being closer to zero. So being these bars should be the closest to the zero line on the far left side of the graph. <laughs> so you see from CMIT-3 to CMIT-5, our model skill is actually dramatically improving overall. And for the two models that I will use in my study that are developed with GFDL that are comparable, GFDL CM 2.1 from CMIT 3 on the top and GFDL CM 2.5 from CMIT 5, these two models are a dramatic improvement. <coughs> um, these models are dramatically better than a lot of the other models that are available to study. So they they get precipitation and temperature much better. <clears throat> so it um, gives us comfort in using the GFDO models to explore snowfall because we do so well with precipitation and temperature. So there is one notable study that has looked at global um, snow comparison, and this is using the CMIT-3 models, and it's only over 2001 to 2006. On the top part, it's observed mean annual maximum monthly snow water equivalent, um, which is a lot to say. What that actually is, is that each grid cell is the maximum snowpack in each grid cell um, averaged over all the years. So it's the maximum amount of snow that you would expect at a given point <coughs> from 2001 to 2006 from the observation. The next, the middle part of the figure is actually 13 GCMs from CMIP three average, and then the bottom is the difference. And the reason I'm showing you this is the main areas where you have dramatic um, under prediction of snow from the CMIT-3 models is over the Himalayas. Um, I'm moving the cursor to show you where. The Himalaya region, Scandinavia, um, the Alps in Europe, and then you also have big errors in the Western um, North America. And these places are all regions which have really strong topographic variability. There's narrow mountains, they're really high, and they're things that wouldn't show up very well in low resolution models. <coughs> so in the CMIT-3 models, the resolution of the models in the horizontal direction to the land surface would be roughly 200 kilometers. So at this resolution, they're not resolving these mountains well, and this is where the errors tend to occur in trying to look at snowpack. So 
our goal is to better understand snow variability. In the absence of the global coverage of observations, can we actually use this new high-resolution global climate model developed the GFDL to reproduce snow climatologies in the present climate? Given the regional observations have also shown an increase in snowfall despite a warming climate, what should we expect globally? Um, also, can we separate the influence of temperature and precipitation on snow? And what are the appropriate uses of these global climate model simulations? So I'm next going to go through the reanalysis products and model specs to explain to you what it is that we're using to assess how the models work. So we have three main reanalysis products that we're using to assess the models. The first one is ERA interim, which is from the ECMWF reanalysis. It has all the variabilities of snow and other climate variabilities to explore this issue. It has snowfall, snow water equivalent, total precipitation, temperature, and runoff. And it's at 75 kilometer resolution, and it lasts through the satellite area from 1979 to present. And the second one is the CNC product, or the Canadian Meteorological Center product. Um, it gives us the snow water equivalent, so the total amount of snow on the ground. And it's at 24 kilometer um, resolution, and it's from 1990 to present. This one's been expanded since that last study that I showed you of the GCM, where it was used. The far right is the Rutgers product from the Rutgers University Global Snow Lab. It gives us northern hemisphere snow covered area, so the total amount of snow um, that covers the northern hemisphere over time from 1961 to present. <clears throat> Next, we have the model characteristics. We're using two models from the scale, CM2.1 and CM2.5. CM2.1 has 200 kilometer resolution, 24 atmospheric vertical levels, and an ocean resolution of 100 kilometers. CM2.5 has 50 kilometer resolution, so it's significantly higher resolution, 32 vertical levels, and the ocean has a mixed resolution of 28 kilometers at the equator to 8 to 11 kilometers at the high latitudes. Using these two models, we have two sets of simulations. First, we have a control simulation, which is 280 years with 1996 greenhouse gas forcing. And next, we have an idealized climate change model where we've increased atmospheric CO2 by 1% annually until CO2 doubles in year 70 and then it's constant thereafter. And so we use these two simulations to understand present climate of snow as well as future climate of snow. I think it's really important to start with understanding what the elevations mean in these two resolutions. So on the upper left, we have CM2.5. On the right, we have the ERA interim. The left is 50 kilometer resolution, and the right is 75 kilometer resolution. It's kind of hard to actually see the difference between these two. Um, you actually find that you have a little bit more spatial variability in high topographic areas over the western U.S. You have a few mountains that are much higher in the Sierras. Um, you also have a little bit more variability over uh, the Himalayas and then over Europe in CM2.5, but they're very similar. You really see a difference when you go to 200 kilometer resolution. The right-hand side is now switched to being CM2.1, the lower resolution model. And you see that over the western U.S., the mountains that you should have, the Cascades, the Sierras, several different parts of the Rockies, turns into one big plateau. So at 200 kilometer resolution, the western U.S. is a big plateau. If you then look over Europe, we've lost Scandinavia, and we've lost any variability over Europe. The mountains are below 1,000 meters. And then if you look at the Himalayas, there's, you've lost some of the variability in the Himalayas. <coughs> focus again on the Himalayas to orient you, um, you really just don't get the really high mountains in CM2.1. Um, you only have two grid points that are above 5,500 meters. <coughs> oh, I apologize because on the right-hand side, the figure that should be there looks very strange. Um, what this is supposed to show is that um, you have predominant um, mountain range 
uh, over here in this region is the Greater Himalayas, which is the ridge of where you have the beginning of the change in mountain height, and then the really high point um, in, over Pakistan as well in this region that I'm showing um, is the Karakoram region. These are two distinct regions that will come up later. <coughs> For the southern hemisphere, again, it looks very similar. Um, I get really excited because CM2.5 even gets the small mountainous country of Lesotho within South Africa. So at 50 kilometer resolution, we, we get really high um, mountains in places where the mountains are actually quite small. Whereas when you move to CM2.1, um, those features are lost. You lose that little tiny mountain nation. And also over the Andes, the Andes get severely truncated. So instead of being this nice long um, mountain range over along all the coast, it becomes one very short, tall mountain. <clears throat> mountain. You also lose the topographic variability over New Zealand and over Australia. So the resolution really matters to be able to get these high mountains. So what does this mean for the controlled climate? Um, as a first side note, the ERA interim, part of the reason it was chosen is that there are no known snowfall-related issues um, in terms of the reanalysis of how it forecasts snowfall. So it's known for having a negative snowfall bias as a result of how it partitions precipitation between rain and snowfall between zero degrees Celsius and negative 23 degrees Celsius. So in e the ERA interim forecast that's currently available, um, there's a linear function between zero degrees and negative 23 degrees where it's 100% rain at zero degrees to 100% snow at negative 23 degrees. However, this doesn't really hold in reality for stratiform clouds. Um, and so that leads to a systematic uh, negative snowfall bias over most of the world. Um, later, model, later versions of the UCMWS model have actually been changed so that this has been fixed, so their snowfall values increase. So as a result, when we're looking through the snowfall slides next, um, ERA interim will always have um, an underprediction of how much snow there is. However, it's useful to be able to compare to see where the ma relative maximums are in both. So for both, you get a relative maximum in snowfall um, over Scandinavia as well as over Siberia. <coughs> and then you also have relative maximums in snowfall over the Himalaya region and the western U.S. If we switch to looking at CM2.1 versus CM2.5, um, you lose a lot of this really strong snowfall over complex topography. So you still have um, relative maximums in these regions, but they're not as large as they are in CM2.5. <coughs> and to focus in on the Himalayas here, CM2.5 is the upper left corner, ERA interim is the upper right, CM2.5 is the bottom left. <coughs> So in CM2.5, you only have three grid cells that have the max amount of annual snowfall um, versus CM2.5. <clears throat> and ERA in term is known to have a severe um, underprediction of how much snow should fall in this region. <clears throat> if we quickly look at the southern hemisphere, um, again, you get relative maximums along the Andes as well as along coastal Antarctica, but there's significantly less snowfall in the area interim than in CM2.5. In CM2.1, the issue of the truncated Andes is apparent, where you only have snowfall over that small region where you actually had mountains in CM2.1. <coughs> if we look at mean annual snowfall divided by total mean annual total precipitation, so this is the hydrologic me measurement as well of how much of the total precipitation is partitioned into snow versus rain. Um, ERA interim, this issue shows up here again because you don't have um, the mountainous region in the western U.S. Much of the precipitation is not falling in snow. Um, snow. So it has lesser value than CM2.5, but again, the relative maximums are in the same place. And CM2.1 is significantly more similar to CM2.5, but you have a loss of this topographic variability that you see in the higher resolution model. <clears throat> um, if we compare 
the original hydrologic um, model output that I showed on the very first slide, which is this right-hand figure um, with our model data, it actually looks quite good where most of the hydrology is dominated by snow. This ratio the, that we're showing here, again, is total annual snowfall divided by total annual runoff, where most of North, North America and Eurasia is dominated, the runoff is dominated by snow. And it matches quite nicely um, with the observed hydrologic model that was used. If we look at ERA interim, though, um, it's significantly lost, that strength is significantly lost over Eurasia and parts of North America. <clears throat> so as a result, the ERA interim was really helpful for showing that ma relative maximums were in the same locations, but it wasn't really good as a comparison for understanding um, what the magnitude should be. So we turn, as a result, towards another reanalysis product, the Canadian Meteorological Center, for their, max, for their snowpack measurements. And so this figure is for mean annual maximum snow water equivalent. The left-hand side has the two GSDL models, and the right-hand side has the reanalysis. And we'll go through some specific regions um, more closely. So over the Himalayas, um, the CMC product, this Canadian Meteorological Center product on the bottom right, shows a lot of snow over the entire ridge of the Himalayas, um, as well as somewhat interior on the plateau, and then as well as the Karakoram region um, has maximum snowfall, I'm sorry, snowpack. In CM 2.5, the high resolution model from GSL, you similarly get a really strong signal of the, of the snowpack over the Himalayas and over the Karakoram. It under predicts how much snowpack there should be, but it's significantly better um, than what we see in CM2.1, the low resolution model, which only has five grid cells where you get this maximum snow, snowpack signature. <clears throat> and the ERA interim is not very good for looking at this region at all, and it's been discussed in the literature the, how it underperforms. So here, the Canadian Meteorological Center is a really good product that we can compare against ours to confirm that we get the right magnitude over much of the Himalayas. <clears throat> if you're curious about European snow water equivalent, again, CM2.5 is able to capture the spatial variability of snowfall in many of the mountain ranges. So it gets the maximum signature over Scandinavia. That's also seen in, CM, uh, in the Canadian product. Um, the area interim product is supposed to be much better in this region, probably because it's um, the models developed in Europe. They made sure their parameterizations worked a little bit better there for the snowpack. Um, and then it also, you have the snowpack signature maximum in CM 2.5 shown over the Alps. Um, however, due to the low resolution of CM 2.1, this, this maximum signatures are lost. Both over Scandinavia, you, you lose this complete variability over the Scandinavian mountain range, and you don't even get snowpack over the um, European Alps. So if you're curious about snow, snowpack in these complex topographic regions, CM2.1 isn't really a useful tool for that. Um, the high resolution model really needs to be used to be able to look at snowpack in these special places. <clears throat> In terms of the seasonal cycle of snowpack, we can turn towards the snow-covered area measurement. This is the northern hemisphere monthly mean values over the time periods in the control simulation for CM 2.5 and 2.1, and in this Rutgers product. So the blue line is CM 2.1, the low resolution model, and the red line is CM 2.5, the higher resolution model. <coughs> now, in the low resolution model, we severely underpredict the amount of snow-covered area in the northern hemisphere. With CM2.5, we've overshot it a little bit, but it does well in different parts of the season. So in CM2.5, you actually are doing quite well as the snow is accumulating. So from August, month eight, um, through December, you're actually, um, the slope of the line of the increase in snow-covered area matches quite closely with the observation. 
it's only when you get into the winter that our model is actually showing a signature of continuing to increase snow-covered area, whereas the ob observation starts to show a decline. <coughs> um, so as a result, we have an overprediction of snow-covered area. However, it's the similar magnitude to what we see in observations versus CM2.1. Across all mo the models and also the observations, everything reaches the minimum when it should in August. <coughs> So we're comfortable then looking at this data for now what the future climate will hold for snow. <clears throat> After realizing that we get much better snowpack magnitudes over the high, high topographic regions as well as um, a good seasonal cycle. So this is, this, these are maps of the transient climate change um, for the future climate simulation. From zero until year 70, where the dotted line, line is, that's where carbon dioxide is increasing by 1% a year. And then it remains constant after that. The top, um, the top graph is for temperature change, and the bottom graph is for precipitation change, with the gray lines being for CM2.5, the black lines being for CM2.1. So in the top graph, we see that both um, models show increasing temperature, um, with a greater increase occurring in CM2.5 than in CM2.1. And then the bottom line shows precipitation also increasing in both of them. However, there's a greater increase in CM2.5 versus 2.1. So remembering back that the amount of precipitation as well as the temperature, which modulates the type of precipitation, both matter for snow. We can't tell, actually, from these direct changes what the change in snowfall should be. So if we look, then, at the global snowfall change in regions that have snow, snowfall decreases in both models um, on average. And there's actually a significantly greater loss in CM2.5, despite the greater increase in precipitation. So this precipitation increase isn't happening during the snow season in snow regions. Um, and it's resulting in this great snowfall decline in CM2.5. <clears throat> so if we look at the seasonal cycle of snow-covered area change, you get a similar magnitude of change in both the high-resolution model and the low-resolution model as a result of doubled CO2. <clears throat> the dotted lines are the climate change experiment for both models, whereas the solid lines are the ones that we saw before. So snow-covered area in both is projected to decline over the entire season. And the reduction magnitudes vary over the season. So there are greatest reductions in the springtime. Um, from February to April, you're having some of the greatest um, reductions start to happen then in the, in the snow-covered area. And also the maximum timing of snowpack actually goes from being in March in CM2.5 to being back in February. So we've had a reduction, such a great reduction that you've actually changed the seasonal cycle um, in snow-covered area, and now it's occurring in the model in February instead of in March. Um, and here's the more exciting part, I think, of the talk. So this is the snowfall shuffle. So this is the change in total annual snowfall in the CM2.5 model. So it's the average of the future climatology versus the average of the control climatology. What we see here is that you have a basic increase in snowfall over the high polar regions um, in the highest latitudes, and then the lower latitudes have a reduction in both the northern and the southern hemisphere, with a few key locations that don't follow this rule. Over <coughs> Yukon and Alaska territory, there are two small points where you actually have increases in snowfall in the future climate. And if you can't remember the elevation chart that I showed you, this point um, that has a really strong increase in snowfall over the Yukon Territory is actually the highest peak in that region. <coughs> Again, in the Himalaya region, this is another special region where over this mountain range in the Karakoram, in this northwestern greater Himalaya region, you have a really, really strong signature of increase in snowfall. And similarly, 
and another high elevation region, you have an increase in snowfall in part of the Andes. <clears throat> if we now compare CM2.5 to CM2.1, you have the same overall structure of the increase in the polar regions but then decrease everywhere else. However, you don't have this strong signature of an increase at these high elevation locations in the Yukon, the Himalayas, <clears throat> and then over the Andes. So in the CM2.1, with the lower resolution, you don't get these really, really high mountains in these places. <clears throat> so, and as a result, the hypothesis is that they aren't cold enough, so they're more susceptible to the snowfall decreasing rather than increasing. <clears throat> so we'll look at that in a moment with additional analysis. And here I'm showing you that actually in obser observations over certain mount over these certain mountain regions, there's actually observed increases in snowfall. So over Mount Logan, which is that place in the Yukon Territory over Canada that we see the increase in 2.5, since 1700, there's been actually a trend in increasing snowfall over the region. This is using ice cores in the region. They've noticed that there's been an increase in snowfall with uh, acceleration of the trend in the last 100 years. <laughs> Similarly, in the Karakoram region versus the rest of the Himalayas, you're going from the southeastern Himalayas to the Karakoram at the bottom. This is the length change of glaciers in the region. You move from all the glaciers at the top of this chart having reductions in length to recently this one glacier in Karakoram is showing actually an increase in length. So glaciers' mass changes are much more complicated than snowfall alone. But the input to glacier mass change is snowfall. The output is melt. So this may be a signature that there's actually been increases in snowfall in the region. <clears throat> so these two different locations where we actually have observations in the present climate in the last several hundred years of potential snowfall increases in these regions gives some evidence that maybe the CM2.5 model, by being such a higher resolution, actually resolving these mountains, that it's actually showing something that has a physical basis. <clears throat> so to test what is causing the snowfall change, we use a very simple multivariate regression model where precipitation and temperature are taken out, are decomposed, their trends are, <coughs> snowfall trends are decomposed into precipitation and temperature trends. Um, you take the trend of precipitation, temperature, and snowfall, and then you <coughs> run the regression to determine which trends of the snowfall are determined by precipitation and which from temperature. And this has previously been used in several different snow studies, um, one of the earliest ones being Moat in 2006. So doing this um, multivariate regression over the CM2.5 model, on the top left, we have the trend in snowfall due to precipitation. On the top right, we have the trend in snowfall due to temperature. On the bottom left, we have this combined um, trend in snowfall due to precipitation and temperature. On the bottom right, we have the actual um, trend in snowfall due to temperature, or due to both that is actually seen in the model. So what we see is that temperature almost universally reduces snowfall. So temperatures are rising everywhere in the model, and that's resulting in a reduction of snowfall everywhere. On the upper left, however, precipitation leads to an increase in snowfall in many of these regions. So there's actually a positive precipitation um, contribution in the western Anyone on the phone, please make sure your phones are muted. <clears throat> so on the upper left corner, we have increases in snowfall due to precipitation in the western North America, over Greenland, over parts of Europe, and then also in this key region over um, the Himalaya Karakoram region. <clears throat> the combined trend of precipitation and temperature looks very similar, similar to the simulated trend. We'll look later at the um, variance explained by this model. But from site, 
they're very similar <clears throat> from the multivariate regression model being able to show us what the simulated trend is. And similar over South America, you get the same story. Temperature almost universally shows a reduction. Precipitation actually contributes to an increase in the snowfall trend. But combined, for the most part, you have a reduction um, in snowfall caused by um, with the temperature signal outweighing the precipitation signal. <clears throat> if we look at the variance explained by this simple model, um, the variance explained is quite high. So this model does a very good job um, over, in particular, the high altitude regions and the high latitude regions in predicting um, what the snowfall trend should be. <clears throat> so why, um, why does this simple model work where we can predict what the snowfall trend sh should be from just precipitation and temperature alone? Um, so the model works really well in the high altitudes and latitudes, which implies that mean temperature should predict the regression scale. And in fact, if you <clears throat> correlate the mean seasonal temperature in the present climate with the regression scale, you find that you get really high correlations with seasonal temperature of negative 0.77. However, with elevation and mean precipitation, you get significantly lower correlations. And the reason for this is that there are three different regimes of snowfall in these different places where snow is, has different sensitivities to temperature. So when a region has a seasonal temperature that's significantly lower than zero, Temperature fluctuations have very little impact on precipitation, or little impact on snowfall. And precipitation ends up dominating the snowfall variability. When temperature is very close to zero, temperature and precipitation fluctuations both contribute to snowfall variability. They, um, they both interact to lead to the change in snowfall. However, when temperature is extremely higher than zero, precipitation fluctuations will not impact snowfall at all. And minor temperature fluctuations also don't influence it because the temperatures need to be significantly lower for anything to happen for snowfall. So as a result, the seasonal temperature in the present climate can give us a very good indication of how snowfall will change in the future um, because we know whether temperature will dominate the system or if precipitation and temperature will combine. <clears throat> um, so what does this mean also for hydrology? and <clears throat> This is a measure of the change in snowfall divided by total precipitation. So what this shows is almost everywhere everything is pink. So almost everywhere, total snow, or the total precipitation that is coming in the form of snowfall is declining everywhere. So that means there's more rain instead of snow almost everywhere globally. If we look at now the change in percentage of, of snow in the future versus the present, so over the U.S., this also paints a picture of declining snow everywhere. So from here, um, this is giving us the percentage change, um, not the absolute change that I showed in a previous slide. So what this shows is that you have significant reductions um, in the total amount of snow, or in the percentage of snowfall across the eastern U.S. Um, and coastal regions of the western U.S. with less influence, less change in the center of the continent. Similarly, of Alaska, you have the co warm coastal zone um, is declining significantly, but you still have these few locations where you have a percentage increase in snow. If we look at the total annual snowfall divided by total annual runoff, the pink line is the outline of what used to be about 0.9, so it used to be anywhere within that used to be have this high signature of the total runoff coming from snowfall. Um, and what we see is that over much of Europe and Russia, this has declined significantly. Similarly, along the coastal part of North America, you've had a significant decline. And you're also showing a strong decline in the run region of the, south, of the southern hemisphere that really depends on snowfall um, along the Andes. <coughs> In summary, the new CM 2.5 global climate model from GFDL can produce similar magnitudes of snowfall and snow water equivalent to the ERA interim um, with maximums in the same places. Some topographic variability is lost when compared to the higher resolution products, 
but it does much better than the original lower resolution model, CM2.1. <clears throat> the high latitudes in certain high altitude regions are really, really special. These are the few regions where you actually have increases in snowfall because the signal of precipitation increasing overwhelms the influence of temperature. And in fact, the sign of snowfall over these high elevation regions in Canada, Himalayas, and Andes, the sign actually changes from negative to positive when you increase resolution from the low resolution model to the high resolution model. This is a really important point that if you're looking at some of these older GCMs, you don't actually get this mechanism that we see. Um, and also, globally, when you're looking at hemispheric values, snowfall and snow, um, snow covered area are uniformly negative and decreasing everywhere. Um, and again, the, an area that needs to be explored further are these special mountains um, where we see these increases in snowfall. Um, and even with the resolution model that we have now at 50 kilometers, if we go to higher resolution, we might actually see increases in snowfall as the topography gets raised even higher. Um, part of the reason I got asked to speak to you guys today was this has been um, picked up all over in the media. So the average public is really interested in what's happening with snowfall. Um, so it's an interesting area to be doing research right now. So thank you. I am open to questions now. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention a thing about influence of ocean currents on any of this. Uh, but I guess I read something a couple of weeks ago that uh, if the Gulf Stream shuts down or whatever, <coughs> Uh, what does this do to Europe? And yeah, so I didn't go into that as much, but there are in, there are the teleconnections of how um, different temperatures can lead to in the ocean lead to different patterns of circulation. And what you're speaking of specifically with the Gulf Stream, if you have less a less strong Gulf Stream, you could actually have cooling over parts of Europe and changes in the amount of moisture that's brought there. But I didn't do any of that in this work. Okay. <laughs> Other questions that, yeah? Not a scientist, but um, in your, one of your early graduates, what's the average uh, for the Super Bob 5 model, and I noticed in the February, March, April time frame, there was a little bit of a bump over the observed values. Would that imply that the uh, projections here are, are optimistic, that uh, we, we could actually expect less snowpack than yeah, there is a question of if we are underpredicting because we have more initially. Um, that what that was showing really is that our model continues to accumulate um, in the season when it should start declining. Um, so it might be a difference in model sensitivity. So we're actually I'm looking at that in the land surface model to see why that is. Are there any questions on the phone? Yeah. Um, is there a – did you look at the variability from year to year for seasonal snowfall? Uh, I'm thinking on the fringe you'd probably see – I think we're already seeing this, uh, that there's more variability from year to year now than there was, say, well, say in the first half of the 20th century or something uh, in that order. Right. So this – this is a simple control simulation with the future climate simulation, so we didn't look at past variability. Mm -hmm. um, but where I have been have access now to an ensemble of simulations that we've created from 1860 to present, so we're starting to look into that. Okay. Another question: um, You looked at basically total snowfall. Uh, snow coverage, did you look at duration, number of days, or number of weeks of snow cover on the ground, and also the number of days of snowfall? Um, not in this study, but we're doing that now for separate regions. We're looking at it more closely. Because we did that because um, for the reanalysis, we weren't trusting as much the um, shorter time frame. And so we want to look at specific regions with observations where we also have point observations to verify the um, shorter frequency variability. Thank you. Wow.
One more question. Yeah, sort of a, uh, I guess, dumb basic question, but I, I think I, I felt that you implied at the beginning of the talk that uh, water embedded in snowpack for the, well, for long-term good is better than if you just have a rain event with the same amount of water that you end up, you end up with more useful water from the snowpack than you do from the, from, from a rain event, say. Um, I didn't mean to imply that um, we have just a preference based on what it should be based on we like snow more than rain. The reason that snow is so important, particularly in the American West and other parts of the world, um, is that it serves as a natural reservoir. The built reservoir systems that we've put in place in many parts of the world can't actually capture all the precipitation if it would fall as rain instead of snow. So that's why we have a preference for the snowpack being there, is it creates this natural reservoir that doesn't melt until spring and summer when we need the water and the reservoirs to be replenished. <coughs> Any last questions on the phone? Yeah. All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you, and that concludes our talk.